After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon, near Salim, because water was plentiful, plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Good morning, everyone. Uh, they say never to start with an apology, but my voice is a bit wonky this morning, so I do hope it, <laughs> I do hope it lasts. More wonky than normal, maybe, as some of you may be saying, but anyway. Um, yeah, we're in John, John 3 again, and verse 22. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being out on a, a moonless night and in a dark place. Uh, we had a holiday last year in, in North Wales and we're in a, a cottage which was right up at the top of a valley with no street lights. It was complete darkness, no moon. And we spent the best part of two nights just staring at the stars um, and just absorbing the wonder and the beauty and the majesty of, of all of that. And in those moments when we're encountered by something that's way more superior than we are, we find ourselves humbled in that moment. Consider this quote from Edwin Dobb. I don't think he was a Christian. Um, he wrote this in, in 1995. Who has not gazed at the night sky mouth slightly agape. The experience is so common, its effects so uniform, that a standard vocabulary has evolved to describe it. Invariably, we speak of the profound humility we feel before the enormity of the universe. We are as bits of dust in a spectacle whose scope beggars the imagination, whose secrets make a mockery of reason. All of us as humans can encounter something superior to ourselves and feel humbled by that. Equally, there are times in our lives when we don't recognize that something is actually superior to us, and as a result of our pride, envy can be stirred up. And, and what we're looking at this morning is, is this, there's, this, there's an encounter in, in, in the passage that Helen read to us, where on the one side we have people who don't understand and appreciate what they're seeing, and a result of that is pride leading to envy. And on the opposite side is John the Baptist, who recognizes what he sees for what it is, and in that you can see his humility. And I guess where we're going with this this morning is, is a kind of a move, if you like, from envy through humility to majesty. You know, we've, been, we've been singing 
about the majesty of God this morning, the majesty of Christ this morning. And that's ultimately where this, this passage of Scripture leads us to, and that's where we're going to get to uh, this morning as we, as we go through that. And we just think back to that moment of standing and gazing at the wonder and the majesty of the stars, how much more humble should we be confronted by the reality of the person who put those things there? That's what we're looking at this morning. In verse 22, the, the scene shifts in John from this secluded, um, this secluded encounter that Jesus had with Nicodemus and we find now that, that Jesus and his disciples move out into the Judean countryside. And, and we find him back in close proximity to John the Baptist. So if you picture the scene, John the Baptist is there with his disciples at a place called Anon, which is probably west of the Jordan, baptizing people still. And Jesus is there as well, baptizing and ministering to people. And Whereas the other three Gospels, if you look at uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all pretty much start with Jesus' ministry in Galilee. After this period of time, what we see here essentially is, is the waning of the old covenant, if you like. John the Baptist is the last prophet, and the dawning of a new day, a new, do a, a new dawn. And, and we see we're caught in this overlap between that old system and this new system is coming in under Christ. And that, that's kind of what's going on here. It's a pivotal point in history. And what you find in, in verse, in verse uh, 25, it says, Now discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, He's baptizing, and all are going to him. A dispute kicks off, and it's, we, just, we don't know who the Jew is. We, we probably we, we could imagine that's a Jew who's maybe been following Jesus' ministry, has this encounter with John's disciples, and we're really not given any more information or detail about what this purification issue was that they were looking at. But the conversation does move on, and when they come back to uh, when they come back to John, essentially what they're saying is, if you look picture the scene, you've got John with his disciples who are loyal, baptizing, but you've got Jesus next door with vast crowds starting to come to him, and John's disciples, when they see that, they say they see a threat to their ministry under John. And they get pretty upset by this. And, and really, I guess the, you know, as often is the case, sometimes when, when there's an envy or, or a pride or a jealousy, it's often dr dressed up in, in pious terms to kind of take the focus off. So the purification thing wasn't really the main issue. The main issue was, look, G, look, at, look John, look what's happening your ministry is under threat because Jesus has got people coming to him. There's an envy and a resent. And the question is, how is John going to respond to this challenge? How is he going to, tra how is he going to respond to this challenge to his ministry and, and potentially even to see his ministry ending? What the disciples see, or John's disciples see, is essentially a competition between two teachers. But John has a very different perspective on it. As we read John's answer, John, John answers and he says, a person cannot even receive one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So instead of John being upset at seeing the increase of Jesus' ministry and the popularity of Jesus increasing, 
from John's perspective, that's a joy to behold. There's not even a hint of resentment, not even a hint of envy uh, in, in what he says to his disciples. And that's all because John understands who, re- who Jesus really is. And because he understands who Jesus is, he understands his own place in the world and in the story of redemption. We live in a culture that tells us to look inside of ourselves for our identity and our meaning and our purpose. You know, every time you you turn on the television, you look at a Hollywood movie, you listen to a pop song, often the words are all about, you know, what look inside yourself and find meaning. There's the the M People song, if you're that old. (laughs) Search for the hero inside yourself or or if you, if you want to come up more up to date, The Greatest Showman, I think, you know, this is me. If some of the words in that song is all about beating, beating the drum to my beat. It's all about me, me, me. Find, look inside yourself. That's where you'll find meaning and purpose and identity. You can be whoever you want to be. And you just have to look at Hollywood, <laughs> all of the YouTube self-helpers online, the self-help books on the bookshelves. All of that is selling a false message. All of that message about marching to the drum that you beat results in a constant longing for meaning that you just can't fulfill. There's a thirst for purpose and contentment that can't satisfy because we're looking in the wrong place. John's life and ministry is defined not by what's in him, but by who Jesus is and his relationship to him. And that's the same for every other person who's ever lived and ever will live. John isn't defined, John's ministry and identity and security isn't defined by the number of followers he has or what he's discovered about himself. And as a result, what you see in the pages of Scripture is John the Baptist who is full of joy deeply satisfied and fully content. John knew the secret to contempt and then as found in verse 27, John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. It's not about what he doesn't have, it's about what God has given him. And we too often can be like John's disciples. We can be dissatisfied sometimes with the gifts, perhaps, that God has given to us. And we need to guard against that resentment and envy by cultivating a grateful attitude with the Holy Spirit's help to guard against that envy and resentment and bitterness. John moves on from there to, to, to kind of stand against this narrative that the disciples are seeing where they see two competing teachers on a level playing field, each in competition with one another. And John corrects that by, by giving this analogy of a bridegroom and his best man. And, and this is to help his disciples and us make sense of what's going on. So rather than seeing Jesus as an opponent who he's competing against, John is a friend who is only too delighted to see his best friend get married and get the bride. The term bridegroom is is deeply symbolic. If you you track back through the Old Testament, uh, you'll find that God often talks about himself in terms of a husband and Israel as being a wife. This, This kind of marriage image is there right the whole way through the Old Testament. And John, uh, the evangelist, when he was writing this gospel, would have been aware of what what Jesus also said about being a bridegroom. Jesus compared himself to a bridegroom on on numerous occasions. And also, looking forward in time, uh, right to the end of time in Revelation, you can read about the marriage feast of the Lamb, where this picture is painted of Christ and this marriage of, of him with his bride, the church, the people who he bought with his own blood. So that image of bridegroom is deeply 
profound and describes a truth about God's relationship with His people that is mysterious. Paul in Ephesians 5, when he was talking about marriage, describes Christ in terms of a husband and the church as his bride. Ephesians 5, 23 says this, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And verse 31, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to the wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. There is no greater intimacy in a relationship than that between a man and a woman in marriage. And that's the relationship that Christ has with His church and God has with His people. So, John points to this picture of a bridegroom on his wedding day and all the preparations that have gone before that, and John the Baptist is the best man who's there to support his friend, to make all the arrangements, to get all the organization done. And and hopefully, when his job is done, when the knot's tied, he reaches his hand into his pocket, and lo and behold, he has remembered the rings. At that point, he can relax. His job's done. And in that, he finds deep contentment as he sees his, his friend united with his wife in marriage. John has the satisfaction of seeing the beginnings of Christ being united to his bride in the picture that we have in front of us. And at this point, his joy is complete. As Don Carson puts it, John finds his joy not in grudgingly conceding victory to a superior opponent, but in wholeheartedly embracing God's will and the supremacy it assigns to Jesus. The best man always knows his place on the wedding day. He's not front and center. The bridegroom and the bride are front and center. The best man is there in a supporting role. John then moves on to to kind of convey the implications of what that means. And in verse 30, he says these words, he must increase, but I must decrease. And again, this is a pivotal statement, uh, both in terms of history in the day, but also, I guess, it relates to anybody that has an encounter with Christ who is superior to them. Um, It's a bit like opening a door and standing on the threshold. John, for John, in one direction through that door is a tunnel that's leading downwards into obscurity and finally to a prison cell. But on the other side of that door is a wide open vista where the colors and the scenery become more vivid and more vibrant the closer that you look. And John isn't describing something that he has any control over. The word must in this sentence isn't used in the way that we would say to a a child, you must eat your greens or you're not getting your ice cream. It's not an obligation. It's not a command. What must in this context actually conveys is there's an inevitable outcome as a result of this relationship that John has with Jesus. Just like a river has to run downhill because it's governed by the law of gravity, it's a necessity. That's the the way in which this word must operates in the sentence, he must increase, but I must decrease. It's none other than God's predetermined will for Jesus to increase and for John to decrease. And John's completely okay with that. If we think about what that outcome meant for John in terms of his decrease, John didn't know at the time that he said these words that he would soon be put in prison. And then ultimately, he would have his head removed and handed to Herodias on a platter at a party for speaking out against Herod. You can read that story in Matthew 14. It truly was a downward trajectory for John. John didn't get to witness the culmination of Christ's earthly ministry through his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. John didn't get to see any of that. 
But when God gives someone insight into the truth of who Jesus is, there is an inevitable work, outworking of this principle in this person's life. He must increase, but I must decrease. We can never have a genuine encounter with the living Jesus Christ without being changed. John the Baptist's life was a complete testimony to this, right from the day he was born, even before he was born. If you remember when, when Mary and Elizabeth visited one another, John was kicking in the womb, leaping with joy in the womb. He lived in the wilderness, he ate locusts and wild honey, and, what, and John didn't concern himself with what he lacked in material comforts. He was more than delighted with everything else that God had given to him. And the most important thing of all was to stand and listen to the voice of the bridegroom, to listen to the logos, to the word. And at this he greatly rejoiced. John could truly sing, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. So if that was the decrease, the other part of that outcome is the increase. He must increase. So just as it was inevitable that John's ministry would diminish and come to an end, so also it's inevitable that Christ, Christ's ministry will increase just because of who He is. And the closer that you look at Jesus, the more wonders and the, and the depth of those wonders you will see. John understood what it meant when Isaiah said in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. There is an unbounded, limitless increase associated with Christ and His majesty. And in verses 31 to 36, or 35 really, um, some of those truths of who Jesus is are unpacked for us. Um, it depends what version you have. In some versions, the New International Version will still have these words from the 31 to 36 as, as if it's John the Baptist speaking. In the ESV, it's almost as if uh, John the Baptist has stopped speaking at, he must increase, but I must decrease. And then John is giving a bit of a commentary on what he's just heard in relation to this and what went before in chapter 3 with Nicodemus. It doesn't really, doesn't really matter either way, but in, but in these verses, what we get to see is to discover what sets Jesus apart from every other person who's ever lived. We see in these verses the fullness of His divinity. We see that His divine nature is infinite. It has no limitations, and therefore, from our perspective, it will, it's boundless and ever-increasing. No matter how much you may have already discovered and know about God, there's always more to find out. I'm going to read these verses 31 to 35, and as you follow along, I just want you to listen out for what they say is truly unique about the person and the nature of Jesus the things that put him in a category all of his own. So let's read uh, 31 to 35 and just listen for those things that set Jesus apart from everybody else. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. 
There's at least seven things to notice here, probably more. Number one, Jesus comes from heaven. Jesus was born to a virgin. He wasn't conceived through the union of a man and a woman. He's truly unique. Number two, Jesus is above all. This is emphasized at least twice in those in verse 31 and 32. And Ephesians 1, 19 to 21, this is how Paul describes Jesus. He says this, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There is nobody above the Lord Jesus Christ. He is above all, far above all. Thirdly, Jesus utters the words of God. John 1, in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus Christ uttered God's Word. He was the Word, the living Word. And linked to that, number four, Jesus has the Spirit without measure. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity in union with the Spirit and the Father, and He is fully divine. And number five, we see this again, Jesus is the Son of God, and a point that, this is a point that John in his gospel, as we'll discover, emphasizes time and time again. Uh, in, verse, um, in chapter 20, verse 31, John says that the primary reason he wrote the book in the first place was that these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus is unique. Jesus is the Son of God, fully divine. And number six, Jesus is loved by the Father. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but one of the reasons, or probably the primary reason, why you're sitting in this place today on this Sunday morning is all down to the love that the Father has for the Son. Because it's the Father's love for the Son that was the motive behind the whole of creation. In Colossians 1 and, and verse 16, it says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Creation was a gift of the Father's love to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I are here because of God's, the overflow of God's love for his Son. Richard Sibes was a, a Puritan. He was a contemporary of Shakespeare and was known as the Honeymouth Preacher. And he said this about this attribute of God and God's love and, and the, the necessity, I think, if you like, of creation as a result of that. He said this, if God had not a communicative spreading goodness, he would never have created the world. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were happy in themselves and enjoyed one another before the world was. Apart from the fact that God delights to communicate and spread his goodness, there had never been a creation or redemption. So Jesus, the Son, is loved by the Father. And seventh, Jesus has been given all things. Abram Kuyper was a prime minister of the Netherlands back in 1901 to 1905, and he said this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Oh, that God would bless this nation with a prime minister who spoke words of truth like that. Friends, these are the truths of who Jesus is. And we need to constantly remind ourselves and come back to these truths. We need to regularly get side, outside of our me, me, me focused thoughts. And we need to lift our gaze to the one who flung the stars into space, the one who keeps this planet 
on a track in its orbit around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, who puts the next breath in your lungs, who triggers the next beat of your heart, who stepped out of the majesty of heaven, who humbled himself and died on a cross to welcome you to his wedding feast, not as a guest, but as the bride. We need to go back time and time and time again and remind ourselves of who Jesus is. Places to, to read and memorize Scripture are Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20, and Ephesians 1, 17 to 23. These two passages of Scripture just magnify the, the beauty and the wonder and the glory and the majesty and the supremacy of Christ. And if you commit those to memory and meditate on them day and night, then your joy, like John's, will be complete. So if the testimony of John that Jesus is preeminent is true, that He is the Son of God who has been given all things, then surely that demands a response. We come to verse 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This verse, verse 36, restates a truth that John has emphasized throughout chapter 3. There are those who have faith in Jesus Christ, and there are those who continue in disobedience or denial. And we all must make a choice. C.S. Lewis says it better than I can, and I'm going to quote from um, a famous thing that he said in his book, Mere Christianity. This is what C.S. Lewis had to say about this claim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He is truly divine. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying that really foolish thing that people often say about Him, talking about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he has a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Jesus Christ is distinct from all other human beings. He's not merely a man who walked this earth 2,000 years ago. He is the Son of God. He is fully divine, and He is fully human. What will you make of Him? Will you acknowledge who He is? Will you humble yourself in that knowledge and repent and believe? Or will you, commit, or will you continue to dismiss, dismiss or deny Him? Misunderstanding or dismissing the preeminence, the supremacy, the superiority of Jesus over all things, stripping Him of His divine nature means that we're still under God's wrath. In the absence of His headship and rule over our, our lives, we stand condemned. Pride displaces humble submission. Joy will find is at best fleeting or completely absent. We will never have enough We'll always be envious and resentful of what others have, and we won't be able to receive anything with grateful hearts. The alternative is to submit to the one who died for you. There's a seat at the wedding feast waiting for you where you can join countless millions around the throne and sit down as the bride of Christ, the one who died for you, the bridegroom, the bridegroom who gave himself for you. And in that, there will be never-ending joy and a fullness and a wonder 
to explore for the whole of eternity. That's what's on offer this morning. What will you do with this man, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God? Let's just take a moment in prayer. Father in heaven, we can do nothing else but bow in your presence at the wonder of who you are. Father, we thank you for the, the, for the love that the Father has for the Son. Father, we thank you that out of that love you created this universe, that you created us as individuals, and that out of that love, Father, you created a plan for redemption that we might be united to Christ. Father, I pray for each one of us here this morning. Father, I pray that you will open our eyes afresh to the wonders and the majesty of who Jesus is and what he has done. And Father, I pray that any hesitant heart, Father, will open the door and walk through and submit themselves to you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen. Oh,